where the Pharisees come to Jesus and said, look, show us a sign. He said, look, no sign will be given except the prophet Jonah. And then he says, so as Jonah was in the, the belly of the whale or the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. And I thought, what an amazing opportunity, because we don't, at the moment, have an oppor opportunity to get, go into the Old Testament, do we? Apart from sometimes at Wednesday we have when we looked at the life of Joseph. But I thought it would be really great to look at Jonah today and have something different. And isn't it amazing when you go to a passage, I don't know if you find this, that you think you know what it says, and then when you learn about the context and all the things that are going on, you realise there's a different message behind it. And I thought, boy, yeah, we need, to, we need to do this. So how important it is to read your word, but also to know the context in which it's written. Because if we know what the context, we know what the message was to them at that time, then we know what message it's going to be for us. And that's so important. That's called contemporary homiletics. Sorry about these big words. <laughs> it, it's the college that's doing it to me. I'll try and keep it simple. But that's so important. It just means, know what they meant then, you'll know what it means now. That's really simple, isn't it? And that's so important for us to, to learn as we're reading Scripture. So it's important that we get some commentaries or so, so forth, so after we've read it and prayed over it, we can look at the, 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 the context. So initially you would think I would be talking about the fact that Jesus was saying he was going to go into the heart of the earth, he died and buried and then rose on the third day, and we see this as a type, typology of Christ. It's true, but that's not where I'm going today. That's not where I'm going at all. And we're just going to look at Jonah together. So it would be good if you get the book of Jonah in your hands as we look through it together. Let me pray again first. Father, I just pray, Lord, uh, that we would just be open to your word. We'd be open to what you want to say to us, Lord. Help us learn through this man of God. Lord, we give him such a bad name. But yet we wouldn't know what we would be like in that situation. We pray that today we would hear from you. And Lord, would you speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 928. Thank you, Chris. So 928. So we go from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. I think that's how you pronounce it. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. So here, the word of the Lord has come to Jonah. Why? Because he is a... Prophet. He is a prophet. If we read in 2 Kings, not go there now, in 2 Kings chapter 14, he was a prophet that served the northern kingdom of Israel under Jeroboam II. And he prophesied to say that Jeroboam II would take back the boundaries of Israel from the empire called Assyria. Yeah? So he, in effect, was a prophet to Israel. He was a pastor to the, kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. He would be like a modern-day, uh, Kent Edwards said this, a modern-day Billy Graham. Because he was the one who spoke for God, and people turned back and repented and so forth. So he, here this guy, God is not speaking to somebody who we think is inadequate. He's saying this is a faithful prophet. I'm going to send my best man to go where? To Nineveh. I don't know if you know much about Nineveh. Nineveh is, it's probably at the time, some, some people say it was the largest city on, on the earth at the time. In fact, it says later on in Jonah that you could walk for three days and not even get to the end, or it would take three days to get to it. Although it does say there's about 120,000 people in, living in there, so that's not include the people that visit it. So you could have millions of people in this city. And it is the heart, the capital of the Syrian Empire. And just, we'll look at this a bit later, the Syrian Empire, as we know, were attacking constantly the Northern Kingdom. Constantly attacking, and Israel were fighting them. And they were wicked. It said, their wickedness comes up to me. That's what God said. So here you have a capital of an empire that is trying to expand so it takes over the whole entire world. The capital of Nineveh. 
And God is saying, I want my faithful prophet to, get prophet to go right in the middle. It's like saying, imagine you were here, 1943, and I said, Zoe, I want you to go to Berlin in Nazi Germany and go, go and then to pronounce judgment upon them. What would you feel like? <laughs> oh, sorry, to put you on the spot, Zoe. But that's, a, that's the kind of thing that God is saying to Jonah here. You're my faithful servant. You've proved to me for 40 years or whatever, however long it is, that you're my servant. I want you to now go into Nineveh and preach against it. What did Jonah do? This amazing man of God, this faithful prophet of God, what did he do? Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. I love that. We say, oh, Jonah, scaredy cat, or whatever, in it, but you can think of the, how a mate... I was thinking that's what I'd do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Zoe would run away if she was told, if she would have to go to Bert, Nazi Germany. So Jonah is going to do the same. He's running away to Tarshish. Now, I started off this study going, oh, I'm going to do an exposition of where Tarshish is. And I thought, no, you don't want to know that. That's boring. Although I do believe Tarshish could possibly be Britain. If you want to know more about that, come and ask me. I'm not going to bore you with it today. But the common, I suppose, most people would think it's southern Spain. But either way, Tarshish, is, even if it's southern Spain or round um, to Great Britain, it is as far west as you can go, past Cyprus and so forth. I don't know if anybody's travelled that way, but it's as far west as you can go. So he's saying, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Well, he's probably not saying that. So he went as far as he could. So he come to a place called Joppa. Now, we know Joppa is... Uh, uh, a familiar place in the New Testament because it's where Peter uh, stayed uh, at Simon the Tanner's house. Yeah, so he went there and he, uh, he saw that there was a port and there, it, it would be like in modern day Tel Aviv. And then he went there, got on the ship, paid the fare, using God's money to run away from God. It doesn't sound like a prophet. He said, what? come on, what are you doing, Jonah? I mean, he knows God has worked through him. He knows what God says has come to pass, yet God is telling him to do something. He is completely disobeying the word of the Lord. So he goes as far as he can, he runs away. I wonder if we run away sometimes from God when God speaks. Sometimes we don't like to sit under God's word in our own personal devotion or what we hear from others or preaching or so forth. And we hide from it because sometimes we don't know or don't like what God's going to say to us. I do it myself. I think, oh, you know, I've messed up. I'll see if I can find somewhere in the Bible that says it's okay. It's not okay. If you're looking in the Bible to justify your sin, you're in a bad place. I've been there myself. <laughs> but we read God's word and we say, actually, speak to his God. Because we want to be courage, we want to be challenged, we want to be all those things. So here, Jonah is running away from the Lord. Now, God is going to say, actually, no, you're not going to run away from me. I'm going to do something. And it says that he whipped up a, a great wind on the sea and a great storm came. If you look here, verse 4, violent storm arose that the ships threatened to break up and the sailors were afraid. And these sailors, or it says mariners in the New King James Version, how, how good is that? The mariners cried out to their own gods. And where's Jonah? He's gone down to the bottom of the ship, he laid down, and he was in a deep sleep. While these people that didn't know the Lord were crying out to their own gods. Didn't we see that in this day? We see that outside. People are more spiritual who are not Christians. I look at the Muslim community, they are on fire for Allah. But yet Christians are sleeping, deep down in the boat. When the storm is rising, the Christians are asleep. Oh, how we need to wake up. And the captain came down. If you look in verse 6, he says, How can you be asleep? Get up and call upon your God. Now, it's not that he's recognizing he's a prophet at the moment. He's saying, look, you as well, get up and cry out to your God, because we're all doing it. And Jonah obviously, obviously didn't. So what did they do? They didn't even recognize him as a prophet. They cast lots, saying, okay, this must be somebody who's causing this problem. Let's cast lots. And it fell on who? On Jonah. So they said, okay, well, it must be him. This is their superstition kicking in. So they go, who are you? And then Jonah then says, uh, let's have a look here. It says here, they, 
in verse... Nine. Who said that? Well done. Thank you. I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. So he's, he's identifying himself as God's prophet, but yet he is asleep. Yet he is the one who is running away. And it's terrified them. Verse 10. What have you done? Because he'd already told them, look, that he was running away from the Lord. And here it says, that, verse 11, the sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make this sea calm down for us? And here Jonah, he's not only running away, he's not only sleeping, but he wants to die. Throw me in the sea. He didn't have um, the bravery to say, oh, okay, yes, this is what's going on, I'm going to throw myself in the sea. He's just there like, oh, that's I've had enough. God is asking me to do something I don't want to do. Just throw me in. Now, I, wouldn't, I should imagine if he's in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, is he going to be able to swim to the coast? He's going to die, isn't he? So he's saying, look, I don't want to die. I don't want to do it. But yet, God, I want God to just kill me. This is a prophet of God. This is somebody who served the northern kingdom for years, who saw the power of God, who saw the boundaries being uh, brought back by Israel, yet he's saying, I want to die. And that's sad, isn't it? So here the, the, they know it's him because um, the moment they throw him into the sea, the, the, the storm calmed. Um, and then it, it goes on and on and on. But here, Jonah now is in the sea. And you'd think it's curtains for him, but it's not. Because God, what does he do? If we go into chapter 2 now. Now the Lord provided a huge fish. Or whether it's a whale or not, I don't know. But it's a big old fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Again, we, I think with this um, book, we try to go in and look at the details and study the details. Like, hold on, how could he survive in the fish? But G remember, Jesus is saying that Jonah was a real character. Jesus was saying this actually happened. He's, it's a real narrative, it's a real character, it really happened. Jesus is confirming that. So we don't know. Some people would say that he actually died in the fish. And, and as the fish vomited him out, he rose again, res resurrected. May, may have been supernaturally protected from the fish. We don't know, but we know it's true. Now here in chapter 2, he's still... He's still on a mission to, to, to blame God and run away from God. Here he says in verse 3, You hurled me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and your breakers swept over me. And he goes on and on and on. Nowhere in this passage does he say, look, Sorry, Lord. But he does end up saying, Look, okay, in verse 9, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, I'll sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So he gives in and he realises this is going to be a sacrifice to do this. He's not doing it with joy. He doesn't want to do it, but he's giving in because, I mean, if God managed to throw you out of the boat, swallow you up in a fish, I mean, you probably would think, okay, I think God's trying to tell me something here. I better start obeying him. So interestingly, the... God commanded the fish and vomited Jonah up on the beach. It's not going well for this guy, is it? Now, if you imagine he's been, in the, he's been in the fish for three days or three nights, I should imagine, I mean, whales sometimes swallow squids who have really strong, hard beaks. And they dissolve them beaks within about 12 to 18 hours. So I should imagine Jonah doesn't look too pretty. Now, it's interesting, now I'm not, I don't know about this, but I wonder if, because um, Nineveh, they worship Dagon, who was a fish god. I wonder if they saw this happen, that Jonah was spewed out by a whale, but not only that, he was, I don't know, he must have looked pretty rotten. They probably th thought, wow, this guy has something to say, we better hear what he says. But I don't know, I'm not even going to go there with that one, but that's just for you to, to think about. And in chapter 3, here we go. It says here, verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This guy, you would have thought, he'd have said, Right, I'm going to Nineveh, I'm going to do what God said the first time. But God had to still remind him, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. He's really got his heels stuck in, isn't he? 
even though he's on the, on the beach, he's been vomited out by the whale, and God has to still tell him to go. Thankfully, here we go, verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Praise God for that. And it was a long journey, a day in. He says this. This is probably got to be the shortest sermon in history. If it was us, we would be, okay, I need to plan what I'm going to say right out and get all the notes and so forth, do a study on it and that. But Jonah's here, he just goes in, unwillingly goes, and then he, in, in verse 4, he shouts this to them in Nineveh. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Let's count them words. Forty, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight words he said to the kingdom. Eight words he said to the capital of the Syrian um, empire. And what happened? In verse 5, the Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And then it goes on to say that the king heard about it, and he did the same, and he called out to people to repent. And it said that, uh, at the end uh, that God did not bring destruction upon Nineveh. So here, just with eight words, he turned things around. Now there is, if you read, there's a particular king at this time, all of a sudden it goes quiet, and they referred to this king as a weak king because there was no fighting going on. So whether Jonah had an impact on this, we, we don't know. But here they have repented. I think that's amazing, isn't it? How he, God has spoken to him, he spoke the words of God and they've repented. Wouldn't that be great if we could just go into a city now and just start, just proclaim eight words and then all of a sudden the whole city repent? That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Let's go to verse, sorry, chapter 4. Now here, even though Jonah has just seen that, he's seen all of Nineveh, how wicked they were. They've turned away from their wickedness and repented before God in sackcloth and ashes. He's still got to be in his bonnet. He's going to be protesting big time. If you look here, but Jonah seemed, to Jonah it seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tr tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it's better me to die than to live. So here he's getting angry with what God's done. And it says that he goes out and sits to the east of the city, waiting to see what God would do. So he's just sitting there saying, no, no, I'm going to see if God just sends fire down on these people. I can't believe he's forgiven them. I can't believe that he is so compassionate and loving. I want these people to burn. Can you believe this guy? I love that God is far more compassionate than we are. Sometimes we want retribution, don't we? That's another word for we want justice in people's lives. But God is far more compassionate than we are. I love that. We'll be watching a, we'll be watching a video in a couple of weeks where they show the difference between those who preach judgment. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with preaching judgment as long as you tell them the, the compassion and the love and, of God. Because God now, through Christ, is offering. He's not counting our sins against any of us. He's offering his arms open wide to people to come to him. There will be a time of judgment, but God now is offering his arm of hand of grace. And I think that's amazing. And everybody, the Father is saying, come to me. We are ministers of what? Reconciliation. That means we're ministers to make people friends with God again. And that's powerful, isn't it? So, anyway, we won't touch on that last bit but God he then built a shelter for himself and he's wanting to die he's wanting God to judge Nineveh but God grew a plant over him to give him shade and he was happy with the plant I'm happy now because the sun's not beaming on my head he was happy with the plant but he was unhappy with millions of people turning to God <laughs> what is this guy's problem <laughs> But anyway, God destroyed the plant and, and he got upset and so forth. So really, what is the point of this message? Why is Jonah so angry? Why does he want such retribution and justice to fall on Nineveh? Well, if you think about it, I was reading about the Assyrians. Remember, just before, as jo when Jonah was in ministry in northern Israel, the Assyrians were coming down and attacking 
constantly trying to expand their empire. And if you read about how wicked the Assyrians were, they would come in and they would pillage and they would rape and they would kill adolescents. They would even, if they caught, caught people in, our, in the Israel army, they would gouge their eyes out and send them back. So they'd be walking in the, in the town, like wandering around blind, so people would just be in terror at the Assyrians. Can you believe Jonah must have experienced this? And not only that, perhaps his parents and his grandparents experienced how evil Assyrians were. And he was saying, I've seen what they've done to me, they've hurt me. They've hurt me so deep. There is no way I want you to show your love and your compassion and your mercy towards these people because they've hurt me deep. And I'm not willing to forgive them like you are. But yet I want you to come down hard on them. Can you see what's going on here? That's why Jonah is digging his heels in. He's saying no. So here, Jonah is the one who's witnessed this atrocity. He's hurt. So he's refused to go into the empire, straight into the capital of the Assyrian Empire, of the ones that hurt him and his family. And he knows that God is compassionate and loving and slow to anger. But yet he wants retribution. He wants justice. And I just think that. That message is for us, isn't it? Because so many times, in the Christian, even in the church, when somebody hurts us, now I'm talking even in going back into your childhood, somebody who has violated us in such a way or done something that has really hurt us in the past, we hold on to that and we want God to come and judge them, don't we? God, sort this person out because they hurt me. But here, God is sending the one who has been hurt into the, what, into the place where the ones that hurt him to show a message not just in words, but actually that he was forgiveness pers personified. That's the word I'm looking for. So he was not just the message of grace, but he was grace incarnate. Does that make sense? So God is saying, actually, I'm going to send you who's been hurt so much to go into this city, the people that hurt you, so that you can proclaim the message of grace, not just in word, but in deed also. And I reckon that's where God, see, he, the anointing, the power of God came down because he was teaching two people. Jonah had to learn a lesson. And because he was willing and he ended up doing it, God then, amazingly, they might have recognised this prophet and said, we've heard this, and he's here in the middle of this city offering grace and forgiveness. And I just leave that with you. I think here Jesus is, okay, he's talking about three days in the belly, and then three days he'll be in the heart of the earth. But the message here is, is of the gospel, isn't it? Because Jesus himself came into the earth to people who had blasphemed his name. To people who have cursed the name of Jesus. To people who says, oh, I don't want to hear that nonsense. Oh, I hate Christians. To people that all over the world are killing his children. Burning them alive, chopping their heads off. But yet God comes into that earth and suffers hurt and pain. Himself was rejected by people. Yet he's the one who comes and offers that arm, that hand of grace. And says, actually, I'm willing to forgive you. That's what reconcili re reconciliation is. Jesus is the one who makes the first move. And I think that's a powerful message for us. That's a powerful message of the gospel at work in Jonah, which I'd never seen before. But it's really, really, really spoke to me. So let's, let's pray.